Let us take an imaginary trip around the marble of yesteryear to discover the changes that have taken place. As you will see, marble used to be a quiet place with little or no traffic, where people could wander along the roads in perfect safety. This omnibus, one of the first motorised public transport systems in its day, is waiting at the top of Dan Bank and has managed to negotiate a herd of cows on its way to Stockport. Buses were very popular in those days, so I'm not sure if you'll find room upstairs. Anyway, if you're ready, we'll climb aboard for our tour of Marple and hope that number plate stays on. As we descend the hill, our first obstacle is the toll cottage at the bottom. There were a number of these throughout Marple, mostly dating back to Samuel Olno's time. The need for improved transport for his textile goods necessitated the construction of turnpike roads and the means to pay for their upkeep. Although from this angle the cottage seems extremely small, this side view reveals the true size. This toll cottage was built to levy tolls on the turnpike running from Stockport to New Mills and was mainly a road improvement for most of the route, although the section from the Jolly Sailor through the village and along what is now Strines Road was a new highway and was in fact known locally as New Road. Prior to this, the road through Marple to New Mills was up Church Lane and along what is now Brickbridge Road. In the early part of the century, Dan Bank was, as it still is today, dominated by trees. The name Dan comes from the Dand family who owned land and a farm in Marble. During World War I, the trees were removed for the war effort and it was some time before they regrew. It was only a matter of time before a runaway motor vehicle helped the demise of the toll cottage, which was removed from the scene in 1922. Today, the only sign of the past are a few of the fence posts on the left. I know this isn't strictly part of Marple, but before we turn back, 17 windows, a very famous landmark that has puzzled newcomers to Marple for many years. This is how it used to be. The 17 windows are at the top of the building and date back to when the cottage belonged to a group of weavers who used the top floor for their activities. In later years, there was a tiny shop attached which supplied sweets and cigarettes to passing travellers. Turning back to Marble, we go down Dooley Lane, where a small community lived in a row of cottages, together with the Hare and Hounds pub at the end, on a very narrow and dangerous bend. By 1970, most of the cottages had been removed, and by 1977, that final house had been demolished to provide a car park for the pub and a bypass on the right built to avoid the hairpin bend. From the other side of the bend, we can look back to the Hare and Hounds and see the obstacle it formed in terms of today's busy traffic. The bypass now lies just about where the, that tree on the left stands. Across the road was one of the old entrances to Marble Hall. This would have been one of the main routes to the hall before Stockport Road was built. Here's how it looks today. However, the ornamental fence and gates have unfortunately gone. But let us once more go back in time and follow the track as it makes its way up the hill until 
we finally arrive at the splendid 17th century mansion, Marple Hall, the home of the Bradshaws. The most famous or infamous was John Bradshaw, who in 1649 was made president of the High Court of Justice to try King Charles I. His is the first signature on the death warrant, and such was his high office at that time that when he died ten years later, he was buried in Westminster Abbey with great pomp and ceremony. Alas, he was only allowed to rest in peace for a short time, before his body, together with that of Oliver Cromwell, was exhumed and dragged to Tyburn, where various unspeakable acts took place. In the entrance hall, suits of armour and many fine paintings lined the walls. An old oak chest bearing the inscription 1497 was among the many antiquities to be found in this beautiful mansion set on a cliff edge overlooking the River Goit. This is the drawing room, containing a wealth of Jacobean furniture and other treasures, including some fine pieces of ancient French tapestry and an 18th century spinning wheel. When John's grandfather died in 1620, he and his two brothers moved to Marple Hall with his father, Henry Bradshaw. His mother had died the year after he was born and his two sisters had married by this time. John's brother Henry, who inherited the hall when his father died, rebuilt and enlarged the greater part of it in 1658. In later years, with no male heirs to carry the name forward, the estate passed to Nathaniel Isherwood, and the Bradshaw Isherwoods lived in the mansion until the early part of the 20th century. As we make our way into the dining room, we can admire the intricately carved oak furniture and on the walls, several old family portraits. Yes, all this existed in the living memory of a few remaining Marple residents who visited the hall in the 1920s on school trips from the Albert schools. This is how it might still have been, but in reality, the contents were sold by auction in the 1920s. And by the early 1950s, after the caretaker died, the vandals moved in and the fabric of the building began to suffer. And soon, the building was reduced to a crumbling ruin. In the background is the clock tower on the stable block. Is it my imagination, or is there a look of horror on its face? The building was offered to Marble Council in the early 1950s, before the worst of the desolation began for what seems now as the very reasonable sum of £7,000. Unfortunately, however, they could not afford the necessary restoration and upkeep. If only it could have survived a few more years when perhaps some means could have been found for preserving it. The hall was eventually demolished but the name lived on when Marple Hall School was built close by. All we are left with today is a rather desolate scene as a memorial to a fine building and an important part of Marple's heritage. Back to the past, and as we make our way up the drive, we look back for a last glimpse of the hall, but already it's hidden by the trees. This path was known then as the Avenue. Ahead we can see the entrance gates that lead onto Stockport Road. This is known now as Marple Hall Drive. Not quite as elegant, I think you'll agree. 
Most of this land was sold for building in the 1930s, with the remainder being built on in the 1960s. Out onto Stockport Road and looking towards Dan Bank, with the entrance gates to Marple Hall on the right. Ahead there is nothing but trees and open fields, not a house in sight. Looking the other way towards Marple, with the gates to the hall on the left. There are a few buildings in the distance, including the railway hotel. The same scene today with Marple Hall Drive just visible on the left. Despite the many houses now on Stockport Road, hardly any are visible because of the trees. Carrying on up the road past the railway bridge, we look back towards the station with the drive on the left. This is how the scene looks today, but over a hundred years ago it looked quite different. The scene then was dominated by the half-timbered Rose Hill cottages. These cottages, from their appearance, could well be 17th century in origin and were on land which formed part of the nearby Rose Hill house estate. The families living here were engaged in the cottage industries common in those days, which locally included the spinning and weaving of wool, silk, cotton and linen. The 1851 census reveals that the occupants were handloom weavers. The cottages were demolished in the late 19th century and a lodge to Rose Hill House was built. Between the wars the lodge in turn was demolished and the present houses on Stockport Road built. Further along Stockport Road and looking back towards Rose Hill we would see the Bowling Green Hotel, the Cross Lane Junction and the Norbury Smithy. There were a number of smithies in the area, but this was one of the last to survive in one form or another. The buildings were demolished in the 1960s and townhouses were built on the site. We crossed the road and into the narrow Bowden Lane. We're looking back towards Stockport Road and the pond is near to where Norbury Avenue is. This area of poor drainage caused the pond to overflow onto the road at times of heavy rainfall. Today the older houses are still there, but the road was made much wider by reducing the front gardens of the houses on the right. Back onto Stockport Road and outside the Jolly Sailor looking towards Marple Village Centre with Station Road on the left. The Jolly Sailor was a busy spot in those days, originally as a stage for the horse-drawn carriages, but then later as a terminus when a Mr Clayton began Marple's first motor bus service to Stockport. With the assistance of Mr Woodhouse, who acted as conductor, they arranged for the construction of a shed behind the pub as a garage for the vehicle. As Marple increased in popularity, the buses were kept very busy providing transport to the many visitors from Stockport and Manchester. Between the Jolly Sailor and Bowden Lane were three old cottages and a number of other buildings. In 1936, under a clearance act, the cottages, which by this time were in a tumble-down condition, were declared unfit for habitation and the whole site was cleared. This is how it looked in the 1930s just before the cottages were knocked down. Notice that outside the Jolly Sailor stands one of Marple's first telephone boxes. After the cottages were demolished the cleared site was used for many years for visiting fairgrounds until the building of the present shops in the 1960s. Across the road stood Peace Farm, 
or the place as it used to be known, and is believed to be the birthplace of John Bradshaw, President of the High Court of Justice. In later years, it was owned by the Dand family. Until it was demolished in 1937, this was one of Marple's oldest buildings. In fact, during demolition, it was discovered that it was much older than previously thought. The stone exterior proved to be merely a shell that revealed a black and white timber building, probably dating back to Elizabethan times. A section of the massive oak framework, doubtless hewn from timber from the Macclesfield Forest, was presented to the local council. Moving along Church Lane, we turn right into Lee Avenue in time to see Harold Riley with his cart containing fresh supplies of bread. Most of the shops in the district made deliveries by this means or with boys on bikes. This service carried on well into the 1950s but eventually the coming of the supermarkets put paid to that. back onto Church Lane and a little further up the road. On the right, scarcely visible, is Hibbert Lane, then a very narrow country road. Hibbert Lane now runs across at this point, and many of the houses on the left were demolished when the road was taken through. On the right stands the Albert Schools, where a class of Mr. Pennington's young pupils stand, dressed smartly for this photograph taken during World War I. I was a, a boy at the Albert School, which was on Church Lane, and the headmaster, Fred Pennington. I always think of Fred Pennington with a cane in his hand. He used it often and very well and for the first time apparently Kings Macclesfield was to allow boys from Marple to take scholarships. He, he, he used to have to go up to his house for private coaching that was in Church Lane and there we sat at the table and he sat at the table with his book in front of him and a cane at the side that was private coaching. In this lower class the angelic face of a very young Arthur Walsh can be seen in the centre of the photograph. The Albert School was built primarily for the Congregational Sunday School at the instigation of Thomas Carver and was the only school in Marple to receive a government grant. Eventually it was also used as a day school with fees of fourpence a week. We now go along Hibbert Lane and look back towards Church Lane. As you can see, this was a narrow country lane, but the houses on the left are still there. In 1936, the Willows School was built on the right-hand side, and at the same time the road was widened. Carrying on up Hibbert Lane, we cross the canal. Notice the absence of the Goit Mill. This photograph was taken from the middle of the field where it would be built in the early part of the 20th century. We can see All Saints Church on the skyline and to the right is West Towers. As we proceed on up the hill to Hawk Green or Half Green as it was originally known we are just in time to see the Wesleyan annual walk passing the crown. The procession is on its way around marble, stopping at various points to sing hymns before returning to the chapel on Church Lane for refreshments. Through Hawk Green and then down Church Lane to the old Church of All Saints. This was built by Samuel Oldner in 1812 after £1,200 was raised locally with the Bradshaw issuers contributing largely. This replaced a much older half-timbered building which was destroyed 
in a storm in 1804. Olno enlarged on the original ideas for the new church and the final cost exceeded £4,000, presumably from his own pocket. Inside the box pews and a gallery dominated the interior. Although Olno met most of the costs of the building, some 250 private pews were purchased for five pounds to be held in perpetuity. In later years, this caused many problems as the owners died or moved away and consequently the pews could not be used. The main body of the church was demolished in the late 1950s leaving only the tower with its six bells. Eventually the present church was built alongside in 1878. Moving down the hill we pass the ring of bells where Charles Clayton the publican is ready to dispense foreign and British spirits and wines as well as ale, porter and tobacco. Alongside were the stocks strategically positioned to provide the drunk and disorderly with a suitable resting place whilst they sobered up and probably saving them from ending up in a nearby canal. On the right was the site of the former Marple Grammar School endowed by President Bradshaw in 1653 although due to his estates being confiscated it's doubtful if the legacy was ever received. In later years, it became popularly known as Old Boothroyd's School before being sold by auction in 1884 to Marple Conservative Association for £200. Further down the road was Church Lane Garage where Malcolm Shaw had a garage and taxi business. This photograph showing Mr Shaw was taken in the 1940s. On the subject of garages, a short distance away on what is now the junction of Stockport Road and Hibbert Lane stood Braddock's garage. This photograph with Mr Braddock at the wheel was probably taken in the 1920s as more motor vehicles began to make their appearance. Back then to Church Lane with Market Street on the left and outside Church Lane Garage a couple of taxis apart. On the right was a popular sweet shop where many children spent their Saturday pennies before going to the Saturday matinee at the nearby Gem Cinema. Next door was Nathaniel Gould's The Grocers. In later years this shop was to become the library until new premises were built in the park, a building where the scouts at present have their headquarters. Turning right into Market Street, we can see the Hollins Mill chimney just visible over the rooftops. The shops on the left had a glass-topped veranda erected in 1904 and still there until the 1950s. In this photograph taken in the 1960s we can see a number of businesses F and L War, Ladies and Children's Wear, Morris's, the Decorators, Hames, the Bakers and Gore and Wilson, the Grocers. On Church Lane at the end we see the Bonbon Sweet Shop and Sevens of Wilmslow Haberdashery. Looking the other way down Market Street in the 1920s. Derby Street is on the left and over the top of the houses towers the former chimney at the Hollins Mill. This hexagonal shaped chimney was replaced in the 1920s. On the wall the traditional striped Pole denotes a barber shop and next to it is an umbrella sign. Mr Hyde the barber stands at his door awaiting customers. 
his umbrella repairs were undertaken presumably at slack moments such as this or in between his hair cutting and shaving activities. Back in 1970 the road was still open to traffic and amongst the shops on Market Street were Arthur Walsh's hardware shop and next door Sutton's TV shop although until the early 1950s this had been a hardware shop as well. On the corner of Derby Street was Albert Bennett's TV and radio shop. Further down Market Street stood the Trinity Chapel and next to it Lynn Row where there existed a cottage industry of Lynn weavers many years ago. By 1970 the chapel had gone to make room for the spa supermarket. On the left, J. Astley and Sons, news agents, were still flourishing and nearby Boots still had their tiny shop. On the right, Garside's furniture shop has closed and conversion is in progress for Boots' new store. Market Street in the early 1900s looking up to the Bull's Head, one of Marple's oldest pubs. This scene was virtually unchanged until the 1950s with the exception of the two buildings adjoining the Bull which had been removed to make way for a car park and William Deacon's Bank. Today only the Bull's Head and the former co-op drapery department remains. Just to the right stood the first council building. Before the formation of the Urban District Council, this was where its forerunner met, the local board. At one of the monthly meetings of the local dignitaries, the health inspector brought up the problem of the removal of night soil. It is recorded that a resolution was passed that the problem should be left in his hands. Looking along Stockport Road with the mill on the left. Opposite, on the corner, Mrs Wood's millinery shop has attracted a group of women. I assume that most of these old photographs would probably have been taken on a Sunday as the residents appear to be too smartly addressed for a weekday. The Hollins Mill dominated the centre of marble and in 1859 it was sold to the brothers John and Thomas Carver who went into partnership with Samuel Hodkinson. Thomas lived in the nearby Hollins house which later became the council offices and the grounds became the memorial park. The mill had been built originally as a spinning mill, but the carvers added weaving sheds to extend the activities of the business. What is now the cinema on Stockport Road was formerly the union rooms built by the carvers for the benefit of their workers in 1878. The rooms consisted of a mission hall where all denominations could worship a library and a working men's club. As the carvers were fanatic teetotalers, a coffee tavern was also provided. In 1929, Walter Stott, owner of the Gem Cinema on Church Lane, was granted a license to convert the building into what is now the Regent Cinema. With seating for 680 people, this proved a popular attraction for the village, whose population had grown to 8,000. Hollins Lane was narrow and the right-hand side was dominated by the mill buildings and cottages for the mill workers. In 1870, the mill caught fire and a telegram was dispatched to Stockport to summon the fire brigade. Although the horse-drawn fire engine arrived within 15 minutes of receiving the message, the three upper stories were burnt out. 
Within three months, the damage had been repaired and the mill was in full operation again. After the mill was demolished in the late 1950s, the Hollins shops were built and the space where the mill was became a car park and some of the former weaving sheds were used as industrial units. These in their turn were demolished in the late 1980s and the co-op supermarket was built. Moving along Hollins Lane, we turn onto Station Road with Leahy Road a little way down on the left. This was and still is a residential area with many of the large houses little changed. On the right however the trees have been replaced with modern houses. Going down Brabin's Brow we come to Marple Station opened in 1864. The coming of the railways played a big part in the growth of Marple making it easily accessible from Manchester and Stockport and giving the opportunity for many townsfolk to visit the surrounding countryside. Close to the station entrance could be found old Joe who was blinded during the First World War. Together with his faithful dog they were dependent on the generosity of passers-by in these days before the welfare state. This was a very busy station in its heyday with a fast rail service to Stockport and Manchester and was one of the reasons Marple became a popular commuter town. The volume of traffic is indicated by the four platforms as well as a good siding. Outside this station the hackney cabs would wait to whisk the Manchester businessmen back to their homes. Transporting their passengers to either Marple or Mellor would have been no easy task for the horses, given the hilly nature of the area. On now down Brabin's Brow, looking down the hill towards Marple Bridge. On the right, just about where the car park is now, stood Dr Hibbert's cottage. From 1774, many generations of Hibberts looked after the health of Marple and Mellor citizens. As you can see, walking in the road was a fairly safe pastime in those days, but horse-drawn traffic took elaborate care when descending the hill, with the driver ready with a wedge if things looked like getting out of control. The advent of motorised vehicles, however, with their inadequate braking systems, soon put these strategically placed cottages in jeopardy. Before long, motor vehicles were regularly embedding themselves in the various buildings on the hill. This coal lorry brought a new meaning to doorstep deliveries. In fact, deliveries directly to the fireplace. Close by was Brabin's Hall, the home of the Hudsons. In 1870, the Hudsons were instrumental in the building of St Martin's Church on land they owned adjoining the station. The new parish was given the name Low Marple. During the First World War, the hall was used as an auxiliary and convalescent hospital, with Miss Fanny Hudson acting as matron. In this photograph we can see a stretcher case being brought to the hospital by army ambulance and being received by Miss Hudson and her staff. After the war Miss Hudson was awarded the OBE for her services to her country. Fanny died in 1941 and the parkland was purchased by Marple Council and opened to the public in 1947. The hall was purchased in 1949 with the hope of turning it into a community centre. However, the building had deteriorated so much that it was demolished in 1952. 
This view at the bottom of Brabin's brow shows the problems that motor traffic had to contend with more clearly. In 1936, the road was straightened and the cottage on the left had to be demolished to allow the bridge to be widened. Across the bridge, we can see the Norfolk Arms and next door, the bridge tea rooms. On the right is the Midland Hotel known as the Hare and Hounds up until 1876. This view, taken from the Norfolk, shows how Dr. Hibbert's cottage in the centre of the photograph presented such an obstacle and why it was demolished during the road improvements of the 1930s. Again, notice how in these olden days the road was quite safe for walking on. Overlooking the river on the right stood the corn mill. This was quite an ancient building dating back to the late 17th century. The weir was much higher in those days, being lowered in the 1960s. Power was provided by two water wheels. The mill was owned by the Andrews and was last leased to the flower dews was still in use until the 1930s. It was demolished in 1962. During very severe winters the river froze and provided the adventurers with an ice skating rink. Crossing the bridge before 1936 took you over the county boundary into Derbyshire. On the other side of the river and looking left towards Compstall, we would be able to see the Horseshoe Inn. Joseph Pover, a publican, no doubt benefited from an exodus of customers crossing the bridge from the Midland Hotel to his premises to take advantage of the longer opening hours that Derbyshire enjoyed over Cheshire. Fortunately, the pub fell victim to the bridge widening in the 1930s. Turning right, we move along Town Street, with the Norfolk Arms on the left. Outside the bridge tea rooms, we can see one of the first motorised public transport systems serving Marple Bridge and Mellor. The bus was converted from a First World War Army vehicle and had a door at the rear. Passengers were seated on low benches facing each other and there was also a seat attached to the inside of the door. On one occasion, as the bus tackled the hill beyond Cataract Bridge, the door, which had not been properly secured, swung open and deposited the unfortunate passenger in the middle of the road. Such was the speed of the vehicle that he was able to pick himself up and after a short run, climb aboard again. The driver was unaware until informed later. Further down on the left stands the Railway Inn and the scene today has changed little except for the pub which has had a facelift and is now called the Royal Scot. A little further on we turn right along Low Lee Road towards the lakes. As we go up Low Lee Road we can look back and get a good view of the village below us. Most of the buildings are still intact today, although some of the cottages in the foreground have acquired extensions. Continuing along the lane, we would have come to Samuel Olno's large and impressive Mellor Mill, or Bottoms Mill as it was also known. This brick building was over 400 foot long and stood six stories high. Completed in 1793, the mill was intended as part of the manufacture of muslins and calicoes in conjunction with Old No Stockport Mill. The mill was equipped with Arkwright designed machinery operated by women and children and was powered by three enormous water wheels, the largest of which was 22 foot in diameter and 17 and a half foot wide. 
the necessary water supply was provided, of course, by the goit. And to achieve this, a weir was constructed and the river diverted and a large mill pool constructed, which became known as the Roman lakes. This, in turn, fed another pool at the back of the mill. The River Goit was a much more powerful river than it is today, since much water is removed for drinking purposes in the Goit Valley. Although most mills at this time were converted to steam for power, Olno must have been quite satisfied with water power, for it was not until 1860, many years after Olno had died, that two steam engines were installed to supplement rather than replace the water wheels, especially in time of drought. In its heyday in the early 19th century, it employed over 500 people. Unfortunately, a disastrous fire in 1892 destroyed the mill, but the ruins and some of the undamaged buildings stood well into the 1930s. One of these buildings, the corn mill, survived intact together with its water wheel and this enabled it to continue working for many years. Today, all the buildings have long vanished and it is hard to imagine that such a large mill once existed here. Across the mill pool stands Bottoms Hall, one of the few buildings remaining from Olmo's time. The hall and adjoining farm were built in 1800, as was a small adjacent three-storey building which housed his apprentices. This may well have been the dormitory for the children, with other rooms in the hall being used as well. By this time there were over 100 apprentices, both boys and girls, employed at the mill many of them paupers from Clerkenwell in London. They worked from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. for four shillings a week, but it's understood that they were well treated by the standards of that time. Close by were two large houses. On this side of the river was Mellor Lodge, Samuel Oldnow's house, or villa as it was often described. Olno was the High Sheriff for the County of Derby. In 1824, in his official capacity, he entertained a group of over a hundred Derbyshire yeomen to breakfast before heading a procession in a yellow coach drawn by four greys. Seventeen coaches and over 300 horsemen accompanied him on his journey to Derby. This fine house later became a girls' school and was still being lived in in the 1930s, but was vandalised whilst it stood empty. It was demolished in the 1940s. On the other side of the river stood Marple Lodge. This was the residence of John Clayton, the miller manager, and Old Nose's half-brother, who took over the running of the mill after Olno died in 1828 at the age of 72. A few years later on, Marple Lodge was occupied by Joseph Tim, a coal merchant who operated several pits in the area. Crossing the river, we go up the hill. Looking back from Arkwright Road, we can see Beechwood in the distance and the entrance to Stone Row on the left. Olno was able to draw on some local skilled labour from former operatives of the hand spinning and weaving that had taken place locally as cottage industries. However, he needed large numbers of semi-skilled women and children, so in 1794 these cottages were built to house the workers that came from southern England seeking employment in the factories in the north. Two rows of cottages were built facing each other over a central courtyard. At the end was the market building. 118 people lived in the 35 houses thus provided, the majority being employed in the mill but some 
in all those other enterprises. Olno originally hoped to have a market established here, but objections from Stockport prevented the necessary statutes being obtained. Eventually this was converted into additional housing. Stone Row was demolished in the 1930s and today modern bungalows occupy the site, making it almost impossible to envisage the original layout. Olno also has some of his workers nearby at Brick Row, lying between St Martin's Road and Olno Road. This is how this part of marble looked in Olno's time, with Stockport Road and Strines Road, Olno Road, St Martin's Road, the road leading down to the mill, Stone Row, and Brick Row. It was much later that Arkwright Road was built, leading to the demise of Brick Row. Further up the road we come to the Peak Forest Canal at Posset Bridge. This section of the canal was an arm running parallel to Strines Road to the loading bay near the base of the lime kilns built in 1797. The semicircular arched entrance to the undercover base can be clearly seen underneath the building at the end of the arm. As most of the employment in Bottoms Mill were women and children, Olno sought to find employment for the men folk in the families. He achieved this by building the lime kilns and such was his desire to retain the beauty in the surrounding landscape that he built it in a Gothic style. Being a considerable shareholder in the Peak Forest Canal, Olno brought limestone mined in the Peak District from Bugsworth near Whaley Bridge by narrowboat. The limestone was fed into the top of the kilns together with coal from two nearby pits also transported by boat. The burnt lime was removed from the bottom of the kilns and transported a short way by tramway to the dispatch building and then directly into the waiting boats. By 1800 the kiln was producing over 8,000 tonnes per annum but within a few years Olno found that the operation was running at a loss. In later years the kiln passed to the Arkwrights before finally being acquired by the Timms who had the adjacent mineral mill. Our journey finishes in the centre of marble, where this aerial view taken in 1955 gives you a last chance to see a part of the village as it had been for many years. Before the end of the decade, many buildings had disappeared. Amongst them, the Hollins Mill and the adjoining rows of workers' cottages, the Trinity Chapel and the Lynn Row Cottages on Market Street. On Chadwick Street, off Church Lane, two rows of cottages and another adjacent to the Carver Theatre went to provide space for a car park and the post office sorting office. Later, when Hibbert Lane Extension was made, a number of houses on Stockport Road and Church Lane had to be demolished as did the builder's yards of Fred Robinson and Arthur Walsh. So that is how Marple has changed. Whether it's for the better, I must leave you to judge.